First Samuel chapter 11. The children of Israel have cried out for a king and in doing so they have rejected the only one who is worthy of being any man's king and that is the true and living God. And God took their call and their cry for a king as a personal rejection of Him because He knew that was exactly what it was in their hearts. And so now they have their king. Saul's been anointed as king. And there's much to commend Saul in terms of just looking at him in the flesh and what he was physically and what he was intellectually and what he was even in terms of character at the beginning of his reign. There's an awful lot there to admire and to respect. But you know, no one is meant to be our king but the king of kings. No one's meant to have that place. Nobody can fill it. It's impossible for anyone to do that. And to follow after any man, to follow after any leader, and to give him that position, and the clamor to give, for God to give some man that position in our lives is always going to end in disappointment. Terrible, terrible disappointment. And it will for the children of Israel. Much better to let the Lord be our King. Let Him be what He alone can be in the lives of His people. But they wanted a king, and they got a king. But their king has feet of clay, just like everyone other than the Lord Jesus. And so, now we pick it up in chapter 11, early in the reign of Saul, and we're told that then Nahash, the Amorite, Ammonite rather, came up and he encamped against Jabesh-Gilead. Jabesh-Gilead is about 25 miles uh, to the east and to the south of uh, the Sea of Galilee. So it's in the northern region of Israel. They come and they encamp against Jabesh-Gilead. And all of the men of Jabesh-Gilead said to Naash, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. What are the terms of our surrender? You outnumber us. You can defeat us. You'll slaughter us. And so... Just what do you want? And we'll become your servants. And Nahash the Ammonite answered and said, On this condition I'll make a covenant with you that I may put out all of your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. An unreasonable man. This is a man who's looking for war. This is a man who's not only looking for war, but a man who thrills in cruelty. It's not enough for this kind of a man to conquer a people. He must be cruel in the conquering of those people. And unfortunately, there are many such men on the face of this planet tonight. Men of war. Men who want war. Men who are not content just with victory, but desire to destroy, desire to humiliate. Desire is to bring a reproach upon the people. We look at the world in which we live. This afternoon I watched the news for a few minutes and saw the two terrorist bombings in Israel down by the Gaza Strip. Maybe you saw it. The bodies of Israeli soldiers lying along the buses and men and women struggling for their next breath lying in their own blood. We see Bosnia. We see Rwanda no better for the revolution that occurred there. Somalia the same way. And just the war that goes on all around the world. And we read, and those of you who pick up information in the course of the year about you know, what's happening around the world, we are in a world that is arming itself at a mad rate. Nations that are so often called by the Western world, third world nations, and in, in, in there's a criteria for being called that, but once too poor to feed themselves and arm themselves, they're no longer feeding themselves, but surely arming themselves. And the thing's headed for a great collision, a great great and tragic end. An end that the Lord knew was going to happen, but 
You watch it and you see it and you long for peace. Yet man's heart is so wicked. You see the soldiers lying around and you say, Oh Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And what is a person praying when they pray for the peace of Jerusalem? They're praying for one thing, the return of Jesus Christ. Because there will be no peace until He comes and rules and reigns with a rod of iron. And that's what it will take to rule sinful man during the millennial period. But we long for His return and how we detest the war that goes on in the meantime and the tragic people caught in the crossfire of these power struggles that, that go on. It was interesting while we were in Israel and it was the case two years ago when we were there. You go to the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall there in Jerusalem. And as you turn from the Western Wall and you look at the wall of the buildings that are up behind you, there's a banner in Hebrew and it says, the Messiah is coming. And it wasn't placed there by Christians. It was placed there by Jews. Everyone has a sense that it can't go on the way that it's going. That something has to break. Something has to give. And so they're looking to the coming of Messiah, blind to the fact that He's already come. And what is the criteria? What are they looking for in the Messiah to come? They're not looking for the Son of God. They're not looking for one who is even a man who is perfect or sinless. They're looking for the man who will allow them to rebuild their temple and bring peace to their land. You say that's a commendable thing, except if you know the Scriptures. You know the person who is first going to come on the scene and offer them that and deliver for three and a half years is going to be the Antichrist. And then three and a half years Later, Jesus will show up at the end of the tribulation. And when He shows up, actually seven years after the coming of the Antichrist, He will show up and then they will look at Him well aware that they had followed the Antichrist and they'll ask Him about the wounds in His hands, the marks of His crucifixion. And He will then tell them, these are the wounds that I received in the house of my friends. And then they'll realize that He is the Messiah. And so we look and we see this has gone on and on and on in man's history. And the same kind of man here. And then he said in verse 3, Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all of the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us or to deliver us, then we will come out to you. And he lets him do it. He said, Give us seven days to find someone to defeat you and then... You know, if not, then you can gouge out our right eye. And he's so cocky. He's so confident that he lets him do it. He has such a small opinion of God's people, so lifted up in his pride, because he only looks at God's people outwardly. He doesn't realize that they have a real God who will show himself strong on their behalf. And so the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news and the hearing of the people, and all of the people lifted up their voices, and they wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And so apparently, in the early days of his kingdom, he just kind of went back to, you know, working in the field. And Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. And then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news and his anger was greatly aroused. He's angry at what's happened here. And he's angry with a righteous anger. And now he's going to go out against these enemies. The reason that this is interesting is a day is going to come in Saul's life and in Saul's ministry when he is going to sit and Goliath is going to come out and blaspheme not only the people of God, but the God of God's people, and he will sit and do nothing. There's no fire in his bones. He's not offended by it at all. It's all been stripped away. All of the virtue, all of the confidence, all of the fire, gone. But here early in his ministry, it's there. And it's there by the Spirit of God. How dare anyone do this? 
to God's people. And it's a great exhortation to us as we allow the Word to search us tonight. How many of us have walked with the Lord for a while? And in the beginning, when some great battle rose up, some great need would rise up, there would be that filling of our heart, a willingness to be valiant for the truth, to be used, to be used by God to bring forth a victory that would speak of not only His existence, but the fact that He is who He is, and to do so publicly. And then, the interesting thing, the same tendency that occurred in Saul's life can occur in our life, where over a given amount of time, now we're just content to listen to the blasphemies of a Goliath out there, and there's nothing within us. There's a danger there. He began with that fire. And here... It's a righteous indignation. And it always ought to be inside of us. And something is wrong when it's ebbed out and that virtue has left us. And it usually has to do with a relationship between us and the Holy Spirit. And so his anger was greatly aroused and so he took, verse 7, a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all of the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers saying, Whoever does not come out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. And then he numbered them at Bezek. The children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. And so they gathered together at Bezek, which is about 12 miles to the west of Jabesh-Gilead. And they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say, to the men of Jabesh Gilead, by tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, before afternoon, you shall have help. And then the messengers came and reported it to the men of Jabesh Gilead, and they were glad. And therefore the men of Jabesh Gilead said, tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever seems good to you. Didn't tell them that we'd be coming out with 330,000. <laughs> oh, details, details. And so it was on the next day that Saul put the men in three companies and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. It's always the end of a proud man sooner or later. And then the people said to Samuel, Who is he who said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring bring the men that we may put them to death. Now, you remember when Saul was anointed as king and presented before the nation, there were some of them, we don't know whether it was because they despised his youth or just despised them. There's not a leader alive that doesn't have some number of people who despise him. (laughs) And I run into them regularly, even in town. (laughs) People who used to come here. (laughs) I see him parked places at stores and I just go to other stores. (laughs) Who needs the aggravation? But anyway, uh, there is that situation. And so here he is and they, and they had said, you know, who is this Saul? And they, and they despised Saul. And now Saul has had this great victory. And it's been a victory that God has brought through, uh, Saul. And so now everyone says, all right, now where are those guys, we'll hang them. They said a dirty thing against, you know, our leader and that. And so now they're all pumped up and they want to hang these guys in essence. It's a great time and a great opportunity for Saul to say, yeah, let's round them up. Haven't seen a good lynching in a long time. Let's hang them to the necks for about 18 inches long. Let's do it. Let's get them. Got their names right here. Got a long memory. Doesn't do that. Paul said, not a man shall be put to death this day. Why? For today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. And here is again something that's commendable in Saul. He recognizes that the victory that came was God's victory. And he was not to mar it with an expression of his flesh. Though there is temptation in the flesh to do so. And that will be a temptation that will come all of our way 
in the course of our ministries. There will be a time where perhaps we will be dealt with unjustly or unfairly. You ignore it. You keep quiet. You go on about your business. And then God brings a deliverance. He brings a great victory. He shows Himself strong on your behalf and proves the accusations to be true. And then will be the temptation to then get even. God help us not to fall to that temptation to render evil for evil, but to say, the Lord gave the victory and we're not going to mar His victory with an expression of the flesh. And then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And so all of the people went to Gilgal and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Now Samuel said to all of Israel, chapter 12, and now he gives his farewell address to the nation of Israel. And he says, Indeed, I have heeded your voice and all that you have said to me and have made a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. You wanted a king? You got a king. And he's got a walk to go from one place to another. That's a bad sign. You had a king who was everywhere all at the same time in the Lord. Now you got a king who's got a walk before you. And here I am, old and gray-headed. And look, my sons are with you. And I've walked before you from my childhood to this day. And so here is this godly old man and he's being turned away from his post in favor of something new. Someone new. And he said, here I am. Now witness against me before the Lord. He's going to leave these people. He's being pushed out by them. But he's going to leave them with a clear conscience. And he's going to make sure that they understood that he did them no wrong. He said, here I am. Witness against me before the Lord and before His anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? I had power. I had opportunity to abuse that power. I had opportunity to take advantage of you. But whose donkey or whose ox have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I received any bribe with which to blind my eyes and I'll restore it to you. Here's an old man being able to say this before an entire nation for the accusation to come forward. And they said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us, nor have you taken anything from any man's hand. And then he said to them, the Lord is witness against you And His anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in My hand. And they answered, He is witness. And so He gains from them this uh, confession that they are replacing Him and moving Him out of His position, but they are not doing so for legitimate legitimate cause. They're doing it not because of any failure on his part. And then Samuel said to the people, and he's going to continue to address them, and he's going to make two points to them. He said, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may, and notice that word, reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which He did to you and your fathers. He says, now let's stop and reason for a moment. Because we've got a mass move of an entire nation now who've clamored for a king. They have tried to replace God with a king. Though they're trying, saying it in different ways so that it doesn't appear that way. God knows exactly what's going on. And they're moving Samuel out from his position that God has called him to as both a prophet and a judge to the people. And so as they're doing that, Samuel says, listen, you've done it. Your head's strong. 
You want to accomplish it. The mob mentality is moving and moving quickly. But let's reason before you do it because reason isn't something that people give themselves to very often when their hearts are turned in a particular direction. And so he says, let's think about it. And he's going to reason to them from two fronts. He's going to remind them of how absolutely and utterly and completely faithful God was to them. God never gave them one single reason to reject Him. And that's the same that's true of our lives. Never a single reason does He give for rejecting Him. God had been absolutely faithful to them. And then He reminds them of their unfaithfulness and that their problems that they were having as a nation and as a people was not because they didn't have a king, but it was because they were an unfaithful people. And no change of kings would make that any different. They had to change their own heart before God. And so he reminds them of God's faithfulness and of their unfaithfulness. And he tells them, as as we saw again in verse 7, that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which He did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt, and and he brings out the, the chapter in their history when they had been but a family, the family of Jacob, and had gone into Egypt and then became a nation, And God was faithful in making them a nation and then delivering them from Egypt as He had said He would do. And even gave them the timing in in doing it. So the beginning of their whole history, He'd been faithful from the beginning. When Jacob had gone into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, when the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place, And when they forgot the Lord their God, He sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord. And they said, we've sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel, another name for Gideon, and Bedan, another word for Barak, all of these being judges that God used, and Jephthah and Samuel, and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you dwelt in safety. And when you saw saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. They were unfaithful. They didn't need a new king. They didn't need to replace the leader. They needed their heart to be changed. There's a message for 86. Let's change the leaders and see what the new batch can do. You think they're going to rise above the moral morass? of society and what's demanded of them by the people and what is evident in the people. (laughs) And now, therefore, here is the King whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And take note, the Lord has set a King over you. If you fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the King who reigns over you will continue, will continue following the Lord your God. Beautiful. Because what He's communicating to the people here is you've tried to replace a theocracy being ruled by God with a monarchy by setting up a king. But you can never move from a theocracy and still be God's people. It's an illusion. It's an illusion, this monarchy. You cannot escape God by setting up a king. And you cannot disobey God and be blessed 
because you have a king and, and you in your mind think you're no longer dealing with God. And so in their mind, they thought they had replaced God now out of a theocracy and in a monarchy. And Samuel is saying, you'll never escape a theocracy. It'll never happen. And then he is informing them as he continues his address here. He's informing them that the establishing of a king will never make up for your disobedience and your lack of faithfulness to the Lord. And he's saying to them, you can change kings all you want, but you cannot change God's Word. And when he said there was a path that was blessed and it's the path of obedience, and he said there is a path that is cursed, and if you go on that path of disobedience, you will discover that it is a path that is present tense cursed. You can set up all the kings you want, but those two truths never change. And so they couldn't get away from what they needed to do as a people, and that was to obey God, fear the Lord, and to serve Him. And Samuel said in verse 15, however, if you do not obey the verse of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? Bad time for rain where you're going to harvest the wheat. And he said, I will call to the Lord and He will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord and asking a king for yourselves. And so Samuel called to the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day and all of the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all of the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Unwilling to repent. Sorry as all get out for their wheat, but unwilling to repent. And then Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver for they are nothing. And that's a perfect encapsulation of anything that would attempt to pull us away from the Lord. And so the Lord, for the Lord will not forsake His people. Why? For His great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you His people. What grace! And moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. What a beautiful thing. He's been rejected by these people. All right, you're going to get what you deserve. And there's plenty more storms where that one came from, I'll tell you. No. He stays soft in his handling of the people. And he says, listen, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He said, I'll continue to pray for you. Notice he didn't say, I'll pray against you. Man, every time I think of you, it'll remind me to pray against you. No. He said, I'll pray for you. But I just won't pray for you. I'll also teach you. You ever have people sometimes come up, or maybe you've done it yourself. We probably all have if we've walked with the Lord any length of time. Someone comes up and says, listen, will you pray for me? Well, sure, I'd love to pray for you, but you know, really your situation is not so difficult as you make it out to be. The Word says this about your situation, and if you would just obey the Lord here and repent of that sin and turn in this direction, everything will turn out all right. Listen, 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 wait a second. I just asked you to pray for me. I mean, don't get on your soapbox and start laying that trip on me. <laughs> well, it's easy. To be faithful to the Lord, we need to not only pray for people, but we also need to declare the Lord's truth. And we need that for our own lives too. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy, they're deceitful. And so sure, I'd love to pray for you. 
Don't you know what the Bible says about your situation? And that's a faithful friend, and they wouldn't know until Samuel was long gone how faithful a friend he was. This old model that they were trading in for the new model. (laughs) And notice that he says that he will pray for them and that he will teach them the good and the right way. He reveals to us in his statement how he's able to do that. You say, how could a guy that is just being shafted by a whole nation, I mean, wouldn't you move to Jordan or something? Remain this soft. And it's all found in those words that says, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin, not against them, but against the Lord, in properly representing the Lord. You know, there's a lot of things in ministry that would be very, very hard to do for people that you'll do for the Lord. And so that's where he drew his strength. And that's the perspective that he looked at things from. I'll do this for the Lord. I'll do it for Him to properly represent Him. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things He has done for you. But if you shall do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Disobedience will not stop that from happening. And Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, he chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash in the mountains of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan, his son, in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. So, Jonathan attacks the Philistines, and... It appears that it's going to get him in some hot water here, but it's reasons of character that he does so. But the interesting thing here is that Saul blows the trumpet following Jonathan's victory. In other words, he's trying to take the credit now. Something weird about Saul that again is an important lesson in our ministries as leaders. And we are all leaders. Leaders of our families. Leaders of our children. Leaders in our workplace. We're to be leaders. We're not to be followers in this world. And the interesting thing here is we begin to see a weakness really and a trend that Saul doesn't deal with properly and it's going to get him in a lot of hot water. And he seemed to have difficulty having strong men around him. He just was always threatened by it. Jonathan gets the victory, and yet somehow he has to make it appear as if it was his victory. It's the same thing when David comes on the scene. David, a man of tremendous strength, a man that could have been very, very profitable for Saul and and what God had called him to, but rather than discipling David and making him an asset in terms of the work of God and, and the ruling of the people... He's threatened by David and seeks to destroy David. And it was a weakness. There was a paranoia within Saul. There was a fear that somehow if strong people were around him, his weaknesses would be magnified and he would be rejected. You see, that's a problem when you take a kingdom that way and you replace another man that way and the people use that as a means of replacing a Samuel then that's the tendency of those people and now you've got to watch your backside with them. But in our service to the Lord, there's no need to be a soul. There's no need to be threatened by men who are more gifted than us, women who are more gifted than us. Why? Because promotion comes from the Lord. And as long as we're supposed to be in our position of ministry, we will be in that position and we will not be moved from that position until God moves us. 
And so allow those types of people to come alongside us and help us in the ministry and not be threatened by them or try to take the credit from them to minimize their influence. I'll tell you, in this day and in this age and in the light of the need, you know, in terms of the things of the Gospel today, it's all hands on deck. <laughs> I mean, are you a Christian with a pulse rate? you got a place on the wall. And, you know, would to God that we would be spiritual men and women and, and full of the Holy Spirit as it relates to that place on the wall. But there's no time to be threatened by gifted and talented people May the gifted and talented people, which is all the members of the body of Christ, each one has received a gifting from God and a calling by God, rise up to their position. No need to be threatened by it. And so here Saul blows the trumpet and throughout all of the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. And now all Israel heard it and said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. Yeah, you attack them, it tends to do that. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. And then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. A group of about 20, 30 guys. Now, 30,000 chariots. Where's Jonathan? I'm going to wring his neck. 30,000 chariots. 6,000 horsemen. And people is the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. That's a pretty good-sized army. And they came up and they encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, I mean, the size of this army produced some fear in them. Boy, just what a bunch of terrible, carnal people. You ever been in front of an army of 30,000 chariots? I mean, I'm not talking about AK-47 or anything. I'm just talking about that weaponry of that day. Hey, it's a pretty heavy scene that they're in the middle of. And they flip out. The people are distressed. And then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. They said, where can we hide? And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. They said, let's go over to Jordan and wait till things cool down. We'll just... The head of Canada, so to speak. And so, as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And so, here are the children of Israel trembling in fear. Now listen, we live in fearful times. We live in fearful times. If we look at situations purely in the physical, but what we must be careful of as we see the circumstances and the situations that would produce fear within us, far better to drive us to prayer. How important to pray. Because one of the great things about prayer is not only that God hears our prayer and that He answers our prayer, but what it produces with us, within us in terms of perspective. To see this no longer in the light of my resources versus their resources, but they have come to fight against our God. And I am in Christ Jesus. We minister in a day, and I love to think about it, and I share it often. But you know something? You and I have been made for this hour. Whatever comes, we've been made for this hour. We've been gifted for this hour. We've been anointed for this hour, for this day, for this time, for this generation, for this circumstance. And the outward seeming overwhelmingness of it. But we need to pray to keep that perspective. And so the army is huge and it produces fear in uh, the hearts of God's people. And then Saul waits for seven days as he had been commanded by Samuel to do so. When he, he was, There was a time where Samuel was going to tell him, go to Gilgal and wait seven days. We're told that in chapter 8, verse 10. And, and so apparently somewhere in here, Samuel has told Saul that. And so he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from Saul. They're going in all directions. And so Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Hey, what is Saul doing offering offerings? That's 
for the priest to do. Now it happened as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering that Samuel came right on schedule, that he'd be there on the seventh day. Well, you know, God, <laughs> thought your kid in seventh day, you know, hit that sixth day, and I got a little anxious on the morning of the seventh. So I went ahead and just took charge of things myself, and I'm sure you'll say, see things just ship shape. I'm sure I did them just about how you would have done them, you know. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and so Samuel comes and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? <laughs> and Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, but he did. And that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. And therefore, I felt, notice that, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering to the Lord. And so here we see Saul operating out of fear as a leader. It's a danger, and it's a great temptation. And what's his fear? He begins to make decisions because the people are leaving. <laughs> oh no, the people are leaving. I'm going to take this under my own control. Oh no, Samuel's slow in getting here by my definition of slowness. I'm going to take it under my own control. The Philistines, they've gathered against me. And this is what Saul begins to fall into and he never recovers from it from this point on. Samuel comes to Saul and he confronts them. What have you done here? And it's the perfect time. God is soliciting from Saul's heart a confession. I can't believe it, Samuel. What a dunderhead I am. I just panic, you know, and I just began to do this. It's ridiculous. I've misrepresented the Lord and the whole thing. Well, God, forgive me as it relates to this. I don't want to ever do this again. I want to be led by the Lord. He doesn't do that. When God confronts him with his sin, desirous of a confession of sin, Saul gives him excuses. Gives him excuses. Samuel, it was the people and what they were doing that made me sin. Samuel, it was you that made me sin. You'd have been here, Pastor. <laughs> Or the enemy made me do it. I mean, he came with such strength, with such force. He's the one that made me do it. And the interesting thing is that you can take Saul, and again, as we saw last week, the encapsulation of his life, it is by his own mouth, I have erred exceedingly and played the fool. And Saul was a man who would disobey the Lord. And every time the Lord confronted him with his disobedience, he always does the same thing. He makes excuses. It's always someone else's fault. It's always the people. It's always some leader. It's always the enemy. And we realize that the tendency of Saul is not distant from every one of us in this room. And the lesson of his life is to be careful of always making an excuse for our sin. And you can get in a groove on that. We live in a society where nobody wants to be responsible. Like, if you I tell you, if you knew and this and that, that's why I slugged that guy. That's why I fired seven rounds into that cop car. I tell you, that's good. And you just wait for the defense that's going to be brought forward for... This sin. It'd be so refreshing to say, I'm just an idiot. That's ridiculous what I just did there. That's sin through and through. Go ahead and cane me. I deserve it. I let him off. <laughs> Put him on the talk shows for crying out loud. But you know, we are in an excuse-making society. And you know what the problem is with making excuses when God comes and convicts me of my sin? There's two problems. 
Number one, it always keeps me one step short of repenting of my sin because I'm making the excuses so I won't have to. And then there is a second danger to making excuses for my sin. Every time I make an excuse for my sin, which I ought to be confessing, it allows that sin to live. His excuses we're going to see later with the Amalekites when he was called to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Instead of doing it, he again blames the people. And the problem with his excuses is it allowed the Amalekites to live. Why is that so significant? Because Saul would be killed by an Amalekite. He would be killed by one of the people that he had been called to utterly destroy. And it's a perfect picture of sin. Because that's why we're told in the New Testament to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to be utterly ruthless with sin. Why? Because sin is ruthless with us. And an excuse for my sin, to give excuses instead of confessing my sin and repenting of my sin, it allows that sin to continue to live. And that sin has one goal, and that is utterly to put its spear through my heart and destroy me. And that's what an Amalekite is going to do ultimately to Saul. And so he was a man who always had an excuse, always an excuse for his sin. In the beginning of the stages of his ministry, did so well, and now he's falling into these trends. And so then Samuel said to Saul, you're right, man, I wish I'd have known this much about your mother that, you know, I wouldn't have come so hard down. No. He said, listen, your mother might have been the wicked witch of the West, but you didn't need to do that. You've done foolishly, and you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. Can it be that simple? Can it be that simple that He gives commands and we're supposed to obey Him? Yeah, it is that simple for which He commanded you. For for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for Himself a man after His own heart, and the Lord has commanded Him to be commander over His people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin, And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. So Saul is rejected. This is a very searching passage to me, verses 13 through 15. Because I'm like you, and I'm like Saul. I'm a leader in the body of Christ. And I look at this and I seems so strong seems so hard you can read it and go seems so unfair and I have to look at it again under the direction of the Holy Spirit And why does it seem so harsh and so unfair to me? Because the way of Saul is so familiar to me and familiar to all of us in the body of Christ. He's become in a very real way the norm in professing Christianity. And so the passage exhorts my heart and reminds me of how serious it is to lead. How serious it is for us to represent the Lord. How serious willful disobedience on our part is as it relates to God's purposes for His kingdom in this day and in this age. And I need passages like these to wake me up because I just, you know, you just settle down to the lowest 
common denominator when we begin to compare ourselves among ourselves, which isn't wise, and we begin to compare the Saul in, in one another, and we all fall down to his level, and then we look and say, everything's okay because that Saul within us has, has become the norm, and it, it's, it's become the standard rather than what is really the standard, and that is obedience. And the realization of how far-reaching my willful disobedience is as a member of the body of Christ. So the passage reaches in deeply into our lives. And then Saul, Jonathan, his son, verse 16, and the people who were present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash, and then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to the road that leaves, leads to Ophra, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road uh, to Beth Horon. And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboam, or something like that. Toward the wilderness. They put these, they got, look at that, and they got three vowels together. Who's supposed to pronounce that? Who named that city? I mean, what's long and what's short when they put three vowels together? Ever heard of such a thing? Now, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. So they're oppressed by the Philistines. The Philistines would not allow there to be a Hebrew blacksmith because then they could fashion weapons. But all of the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his his axe, and his sickle. And the charge for sharpening them was a pen for the plowshares, a bargain, and the mattocks and uh, the forks and the axes and to set the points of the goads. And so it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. In other words, they're the only two that had weapons. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. And so